Hi everyone, this is Diary of a Mystic. Welcome to One Bad Tarot Reader Podcast 13. Lucky 13. Thanks to those that like to tune in and listen to this podcast. I really appreciate it. And One Bad Tarot Reader Podcast 13. What are we going to talk about? Lucky 13. I've noticed people are using the term, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I'm talking about people that primarily aren't psychics or tarot readers or clairvoyants, like everyday people. I keep hearing people say casually or in conversation, well, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. And I'm like, wow, is this a thing? <laughs> did I miss did I miss this? This must be a thing. So I keep hearing people say, I don't have a crystal ball. And I laugh at it because I'm like, wow. And primarily they're using it when, you know, they're second guessing themselves or they're not sure about something or they don't know how it's gonna turn out. They're like, Well, I don't have a crystal ball. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit today. And also what it's like to be uh, a true crime tarot reader and to be in that genre and to be in that community. So buckle your seatbelts. We're in for a bumpy ride. So according to the UrbanDictionary.com, I don't have a crystal ball is essentially a snarky remark you make when feeling between a rock and a hard place because you're demanded to take a decision you are powerless, incapable, or unwilling to take. So I don't think this is a new thing. Uh, This was published June 28th, 2010. So this has been around for a long time. I'm just now hearing this phrase being said. (laughs) But apparently the first famous person to ever say, I don't have a crystal ball, (laughs) was President Obama. (laughs) So when you hear the phrase, I don't have a crystal ball, that's what it means. Now, for someone who embraces the esoteric, who embraces the psychic realm, who embraces her intuitiveness, that to me just sounds kind of funny. And it would be for anybody who's intuitive or an empath or who has psychic abilities or who's clairvoyant or who dives or dwells in reading the tarot cards, oracle cards, whatever, etc. right? (laughs) So I don't have a crystal ball. Now, I did hear this being said by one of the police officers during the Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie stop on the body cam. And I remember hearing him say that in the body cam because he was feeling between a rock and a hard place and he was being called upon to make a decision that he felt very powerless in making, right? I've also heard other YouTubers in the true crime community say this phrase as well. And as a reader in the true crime community or a true crime tarot reader, this genre of tarot reading has picked up popularity, especially the last few years. I jumped on the the bandwagon early 2019, so January 2019, so almost close to three years coming up. Since then, I have seen, uh, just like I did, general tarot readers who do general weekly, monthly readings for the public for your astrological sign transfer over or also mix true crime with their general tarot reading channels. 
And so, for instance, probably the most popular one uh, is Anphrodite. If you've ever seen him, his aesthetic is, you know, like super duper girly and super duper pink and, uh, and all that fabulousness. And so true crime terror reading has picked up its pace. So what's the difference in reading for true crime cases and what's the difference in being a private or personal terror reader for clients? There's a huge, huge difference for me in particular. And that is when you're doing a client reading you may or may not encounter real lower vibrational negative energies. Many times you can, but with true crime cases, you're going into something that involves the unknown, primarily because you're automatically dealing with something that is very much resonating with evil because it's a crime dealing with death or a crime dealing with murder or a crime dealing with a missing person. And that energy comes from a very evil, low vibrational, negative space. And so it's not so easy to sit down and go into that energy, okay? So you really, I feel you have to put more protective barriers around yourself when you go into reading these cases. And when a case comes along that I've never heard about or everybody's talking about it, and then it piques my interest is when I decide to sit down and do a true crime reading And for instance, there have been a few cases that I've been asked to look into that my spirit is just telling me, no, don't do that. And so I only feel comfortable with the ones that I choose to sit down and read for. And I keep my comments section open on my true crime readings until the victim blaming comes in. I don't like to see people leaving victim blaming comments towards the victim in my readings and I'll temporarily disconnect the comments for a while until the trolls go away and go somewhere else and then I'll reinstate them. And so, for instance, I had a comment on uh, one of the latest Brian Laundry videos that I've done asking for an updated reading. And I did this reading six days ago and someone asked, time for an updated tarot reading on where is Brian? And I'm not the type of reader that will subsequently read over and over and over on the same case because patience is needed when you're doing any type of reading. I don't recommend even a private client to get more than one reading within a month's time. Patience is needed because things will unfold and things primarily because I'm a predictive reader, things will unfold in time. So that it's unnecessary for me to re repeatedly perform true crime readings on the same case over and over and over and try to pull a rabbit out of a hat to force something that doesn't need to be forced. Does that make any sense? And so also because I don't necessarily want to sit down and dive into that muck again because 
these readings can be very heavy. You have a tendency sometimes to get very depressed, uh, feel very tired, and they're heavy. They're negative and they're heavy. So I don't sit down and just repeatedly do readings. I do feel called sometimes, though, to do an updated reading, which I'll give some space in between. So with being a true crime tier reader in the true crime community, it's a thing. The blending of true crime channels to true crime tarot readers or true crime psychic readers, however the person wants to call themselves, true crime psychic detectives, whatever it is that however you want to uh, formulate it or tag yourself as or label yourself as or call yourself as, there's really not an acceptance because true crime is based in fact. It's based in logic. It's based on evidence that we can physically see, that we can uh, audibly hear that is presented before us, okay? And so sometimes psychics will come into the mix. Typically, when nothing is going on with the case is when people will find an interest and go over to the true crime psychic side just out of speculation, curiosity, interest, etc. For me, personally, as a true crime tarot reader, I wanted to do this because that's my interest, as well as other things that are paranormal. And I only go so far in my readings on true crime cases. What really turns me off as a true crime reader are seeing readers who really go all in with the gory details of what they're seeing. I think that there should be a line drawn in the sand ethically on how much you are willing to share. Okay? And I've always said this, I don't share everything that I see in the readings, primarily because of that. It's a little, to me, it's a little tacky. It can be uh, a little gross to share all these gory details of things that you're picking up um, psychically or intuitively or clairvoyantly because you never know who's watching and you never know who's listening. And so I think that many times readers will go all out with the gory details um, and that's fine. That's what they want to do. That's their thing. But for me personally, I just, I'm not into doing that, you know. Uh, I'm not into doing that at all. And many times uh, I'll pick up on things energetically that are going on within the person's relationship, within the person's family dynamics, within the whole situation itself, etc. I'm also shown um, directions and I'm also shown timing of events. And so the true crime community, some channels will invite uh, tarot readers or psychics onto their channel, which I think is really, really cool. Uh, some just basically stay away from that. They don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, 
and I respect that as well. And so doing true crime readings is very, very different than sitting down and doing a personal reading for a client. And when you're tapping into these energies that are really based around anger, violence, destruction, evil, uh, you can have these things attached to you. So it's really, really important to space it out, take breaks in between, and to take proper precautions to cleanse yourself, to cleanse your space, etc. So I really am I'm mindful of that, and I think that that's really important. And sometimes in the true crime terror reader genre, conspiracy theories will come into play. So you'll start to attract conspiracy theorists or people have, who have these theories. Uh, sometimes they're really fascinating and interesting to me. And then sometimes they're just like way off down the rabbit hole, Alice. <laughs> Like, what in the heck's going on? I don't even want to go there, Vita. Okay, I'm just like, I'm staying away from that. And so these conspiracy theorists can also come into the mix or come into play as well. So you start to get that coming in, especially in terms of comments from people that tune into your readings. And then sometimes I have noticed, and I welcome this to a degree, that other readers or people that say, oh, I've done a reading myself that may not have a YouTube channel, or I've done a reading on my own that will share what they've also picked up on as well. I find that fascinating not to the point where they're starting to piggyback off my channel to promote their reading. Um, that to me is a little like, really, you know? Uh, <laughs> but I, I invite those that also have uh, psychic visions or their own intuitiveness about a certain case, or if they've done their own private reading to themselves at home, I welcome that. That's that's cool. Um, and I, probably the number one comment that I get many times when people watch my readings, especially newcomers or people for the first time, is what kind of shuffle is that? Or I can't believe you shuffle it. What kind of shuffle? It? I've never seen nobody shuffle like that. <laughs> because everybody's used to the the, the cut, the cut shuffle where they're, you know, basically just uh, cutting the cards uh, until a card flies out or a card pops out and, or they do the casino style shuffling or whatever, what have you. That, I do the overhand shuffle. I was, I'm the overhand shuffler from the early 90s. I'm old school, G. That's how I taught myself, and that's how I've always felt comfortable with it. And nobody, nobody's used to that. I've met a couple of people online who also shuffle the same way, which is always like, oh my God, my long lost sister, you know. Um, but anyway, and so, and so true crime readings, uh, are very, very different from private readings. And yeah, I don't have a crystal ball. I think many, many times that detectives and law enforcement go on their gut instinct. And I think they also have intuitive capabilities they pick up on feelings, they pick up on vibrations, they pick up on 
sensory things because they're reading essentially body language or they're looking at how a person speaks. They're analyzing, right? And so where's the difference between that and doing or performing divination or tapping into your intuitive abilities? I feel it's very much the same because they're using their intuitive abilities, their intuitive sensory perceptions to things, but they're not going to label it that, you know. Um, but I feel very much a lot of these true crime channels also will say, you know, well, I have a feeling, I always had a feeling about this, but well, you're using your intuition, you know, and many of these true crime channels are very intuitive, empathic people. They have empathy towards the victim. They have empathy and compassion towards the situation. And so, true crime reading, I don't know how long I'm going to be doing this. I don't like to really get down and dirty with past cases. I've been asked to read about like Jean Bonnet, uh, you know, past cases dealing with um, cases that happened 30 years ago. Uh, you know, there's just some things I don't want to approach. Um, when I started, I came off the tail of Chris Watts and my first reading that I ever did was the Jamie Kloss case. I have those videos. Um, I took them down because essentially she was found and I just felt that I didn't want her to ever have to see something like that one day. But that was the first case that I read about was the Chris Watts and then uh, Jamie Kloss, then Carly Gousset, uh, and it went from there. And so there are so many missing person cases. There are so many cold cases. There are so many cases, and this will be another podcast, that never see the light of day in the media, that never pick up speed or attention on YouTube, that never ever get the deserved attention or recognition that these victims deserve. And so uh, one in particular that I've done that I think about every day is Kaya, Taylor. And I've done a reading on her on my YouTube channel. She was from Florida and she was missing from Florida, I believe almost two years ago now. Um, she's one in particular that I often think about. I often think about uh, a few of these cases where the body's never found, the person's never found, um, you know, the spouse or the boyfriend's brought to justice, like in terms of Barry and Morphew, Suzanne Morphew was never found, or in terms of Kelsey Barrett, you know, Kelsey Barrett was never found. And so you think about these things. Um, you think about these cases and these victims who have never been found and nothing has ever come about with it, or they just never pick up national or even worldwide attention. And it's crazy. So Kaya Taylor is an example and she was 28 years old and she's missing from Plant City, Florida. And I might uh, include her video, attach it, and put it in the description box below. And she was last seen on February 6, 2020. And I follow her family's Facebook group for Kaya. 
and she has never been found. Nothing has ever come about with that case. Nobody has ever been charged or formally charged. And it's just a mystery to me. And so cases like that, um, that don't get picked up necessarily, they do get picked up by the media, but they don't take off. They don't take off like a Summer Wells or Gabby Petito or Suzanne Morphew or, you know, some of these cases that were the Delphi murders. Some of these cases just never get any attention. And so how does that happen? You know, how does that occur? How does that happen? I don't know. And true crime's popularity has always been around, but with YouTube in the last 15, 16 years, true crime has really picked up, I feel, especially now with YouTubers that have been doing true crime for years and years, uh, there's new true crime channels all the time. And you'll notice many true crime channels start or have been around for a while and pick up speed with one case in particular. Either that YouTuber lives near where the case is happening or the victim has gone missing or has been murdered. Uh, so there's many, many, many variables to how a true crime channel gets started or how a true crime channel gets noticed, etc. It's also the same thing with true crime chair reading channels, uh, etc. And so many times true crime chair readers will be known for, for one case in particular or will gain popularity from one or two cases in particular. You'll see that happen as well. And so I don't know how long I'll be doing true crime readings. Uh, the true crime genre, of course, will never go away, unfortunately, in this mad, mad world that we live in. Uh, however, I think it's really important to be mindful as a true crime terror reader. Uh, because there's so many mixed opinions about um, reading as a true crime reader. Many people have mixed emotions about it. And um, many people are supportive of it and many people aren't. <laughs> but I go by my own code of terms and ethics in terms of reading in general, just for anybody. And so, uh, true crime for me can be, in a word, it's, it's almost like an adrenaline rush when you're invested in a case so much emotionally and new information is coming out and you're wanting justice, you're wanting you're wanting the bad guy to get caught. It's it's kind of like that um, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman type of thing. And we all want the bad guys to get caught and we all want to see justice be served. And I think that's why people get hooked. And we also get, get hooked because we cannot imagine that monsters exist, that real evil in this world exists, and that scares us. And we also live for the adrenaline rush, and we also live for the drama of, oh my God, what's happening now? You know, uh, when your phone lights up with all these YouTubers going live, a bing, 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 you know something's happened, or you know something's going on. And so we all kind of, oh shit, you know, what's happening now? And so 
I wanted to talk about, you know, I don't have a crystal ball um, <laughs> and true crime and being a true crime tier reader. Uh, I do have a crystal ball. <laughs> Mystic Village's uh, logo is the crystal ball. So thank you for listening. This is One Bad Tier Reader Podcast 13. Lucky 13. Leave your thoughts below. Thank you to all that love to listen to this podcast. I really appreciate it. And I will speak to you next time. If you have any topics you want me to discuss, or uh, maybe I'll do a Q&A for a podcast in the future, um, leave your question. So stay safe out there. Stay blessed, everyone. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon.